Good day. For those of you who do not know us, we are the instructional staff for ECE 150, Professors Hiran Patel and Werner Dietl, and Douglas Harder. In this lecture, we're going to cover the assert function. This is the first in a sequence of six topics on C assertions, code development strategies, testing, commenting your code, using print statements for debugging, and using tracing for debugging. So in this topic, we are going to describe the assert function. We will consider its uses and also see how to turn these assertions off. Now, up to this point, we've only executed functions and dealt with all possible arguments. However, sometimes the arguments may, may have to be restricted. For example, the factorial function is not actually defined for negative integers. You cannot say that negative one factorial is some value. It's explicitly not defined. When we implemented it previously, we just returned zero because, well, we didn't have anything better to do. Also, up until now, we've arbitrarily executed the alternative body in a conditional statement. However, it might be nice to check if the state is appropriate in that conditional statement. And so we'll look at some examples of that. So basically, we want to make sure that the conditions for the alternative body are in fact being met. An assertion is a function that takes a Boolean value condition in your code. Now, if while the code is executing, if that condition evaluates to true, the program just continues executing. If the condition evaluates to false, the program terminates with an error indicating what the incorrect condition was or what the failing condition was. So for example, here we have the factorial function. The factorial of the function is defined for all integers greater than or equal to zero and is not defined if the argument is negative. So now, instead of returning zero, we're, in, we're going to have an assertion that n is greater than or equal to zero. Now, some of you may note that we are clearly putting the word function in double quotes, indicating it probably isn't a function. It's actually a macro. Now this is way beyond the scope of this course, and so as far as most of you are concerned, you can just treat it like a function with a Boolean valued condition. It's almost just like an if statement without a body. Now, to use an assertion in your program, you must include the C assert library. And that is similar to including the C math library or IO stream. In this case, the command is just include C assert. So consider the following program. Here we are testing the factorial function. And so we include the C assert library. Now, following main, we must of course also define the factorial function, which we saw on the previous slide. However, now we see that we are calculating 10 factorial, 0 factorial, which should evaluate correctly, but we also see that we are calculating negative 2 factorial, which is invalid. So if we were to compile and execute this program, this is the following output. 10 factorial does evaluate correctly to 3,628,800. 0 factorial is equal to 1. And then for factorial of negative 2, it says specifically in this program or in this executable created from the file example.cpp on line 18 inside the factorial function, there is an assertion that failed. Specifically, the assertion n greater than or equal to zero failed. 
Now you can go back to your code and see whether or not the program incorrectly called the function with an invalid argument or if perhaps your function implementation or your assertion is wrong. In either case, this tells you that something unexpected happened. All right, now let's consider the following program. This program is going to evaluate the factorial function for values of k between 0 and 17 inclusive. So let's take a look what happens if we compile this program and execute it. Here's the output. 0 factorial is equal to 1, 1 factorial is equal to 1, so far so good, 4 factorial, 5, those all look more or less right. Now, if we go down here and look at 11 factorial, we see that's about 40 million. Now, 40 million times 12 is indeed close to 480 million. But 12 factorial times 13, which gives you 13 factorial, should give you a value that's at least 10 times larger than 12 factorial, but it's not. It's only closer to 2 billion, not greater than 4.8 billion. So something's wrong here with 13 factorial. You'll notice that 14 factorial is actually smaller than 13 factorial. 15 factorial and 16 factorial are approximately the same, and 17 factorial is negative. So there seems to be a problem with calculating factorials for values of when the argument is greater than or equal to 13. Now, in a few lectures, you're going to understand why this is the case. However, right now, we're only going to modify the assertion to ensure that we never call the factorial function with an argument for which our program cannot give a correct answer. Thus, we will include the following assertion in our factorial function. We will assert not only is n greater than or equal to 0, but also we will assert that n is less than or equal to 12. So if anyone accidentally calls the factorial function with an argument 13 or greater, rather than returning the wrong result, the program will return an error. Once again, in a few lectures, we will see why this is happening. However, for now, this is just one more case where an assertion can be used to prevent the user from making a mistake that is, calling a function with an argument that must return an invalid answer. Now, you may recall in a previous topic we introduced the following cubic spline. This is a cubic polynomial that has a value of 0 when x equals 0, a value of 1 when x is equal to pi over 2, a slope of 1 when x is equal to 0, and a slope of 0 when x is equal to pi over 2. Now, you will learn how to calculate such splines in your second year course on numerical analysis, and it will use the tools you are currently learning in your course on linear algebra. Now, if we plot this cubic function, it does, yes, indeed, look like a cubic. However, if we plot this function together with the sine function, we actually see that it's actually a very good approximation of the sine function so long as the value of x is between 0 and pi by 2. It's not a very good approximation of the sine function outside of this interval. Consequently, if we were to use this spline to approximate the sine function, then we should make sure that the argument is never outside the, this interval from 0 to pi over 2. Alright, 
So here is now our program where I have a function called mySine which will evaluate the cubic spline we previously saw. However, we will include the following assertion. We will assert that the value of the parameter is greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to pi over two. Now, here we are calling my sign, the function we just wrote, with an argument of 0 0.5. We will also call it, call the actual sign function in the standard CMath library with the same argument to compare the two values. I will then call my sign with the value 1.6. 1.6 is greater than pi over 2, so the assertion should fail. And so if we compile and execute this code, notice that my sign is accurate to just about two significant digits. However, when we try to calculate my sign with an argument of 1.6, we get that the assertion failed. That is, x greater than or equal to zero and x less than or equal to pi over two, that assertion failed. And so rather than calculate an erroneous answer, the program terminated. And now it is our, uh, our obligation to go back and see what happened. In this case, the problem was we called my sign with an argument that was outside the interval from zero to pi by two. Now, suppose that we have a cascading conditional statement. That is, a conditional statement with at least one else if condition. Up until now, we have just blindly executed the complementary alternative body if all of the conditions failed. Here's an example of the tent function. Now, this tent function here is a mathematical implementation of this function that we see here on the right. And this is, of course, used in engineering on occasion. Now, we have a complementary alternative body here. So, it may actually be useful to ensure that the condition we are expecting in the complementary alternative body is actually what is occurring. So here, for example, First, we check the condition. Is x less than or equal to z negative 1, or is x greater than or equal to 1? In this case, we just return 0. If x is less than 0 at this point, that means we must be somewhere on the interval from negative 1 to 0. In this case, we return the value of the function on the increasing slope. So we return x plus 1. If both of these conditions are false, then x must be greater than 0 but less than 1, in which case we return the value 1 minus x, which gives us the decreasing slope from 1 back down to 0. However, suppose we want to check to make sure that x is on this interval. In this case, we can include an assertion which says we expect x to be greater than 0 and we expect x to be less than 1. Now, if one of our previous conditions is wrong and we try to execute the alternative body where x is outside of this interval, then the assertion will fail and this will make sure that we catch this error. Okay, so following this topic, you now know how to use the assert function. You essentially just call assert and you include a condition as an argument of the assert function. It's actually a macro, but don't worry about it. You understand that it can be used 
to ensure that an argument that is passed to the function is as you would expect. It also ensures that values in, for example, a conditional statement are what they actually should be when the code is executing. So you can use this to help catch errors in your code. Now, you will never need an assertion to pass anything in this course. However, while you're developing your code, it can be useful in helping you catch errors in your own code development. And we're going to look at how we can use this later on in subsequent topics. Here are some useful references for assertions, including Wikipedia and C++.com, which gives a very nice reference or description of the C of the assert macro. The acknowledgments, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!